fancy. <laughs> there you are. Thank you, Ken, for being our facilitator today. Okay, well, I think probably everybody got the title, Water, Water Everywhere, but not enough to put out the fire because we've been watching the Western United States burn up this year uh, with a huge number of fires and it's all over the news, of course, and everything. And, and uh, Donna's brother lives out in, in San Jose, so we're, we're always worried about <laughs> where the fires are out there and that type of thing. And then, of course, on the eastern coast, we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen a lot of water dumped on the eastern coast. And, and so that's, that's where the title comes from. Uh, let's see what I'm going to do here. Okay, I'm going to change to the laser pointer because it's a little easier to see when pointing things out. This is this talk is going to be obviously on global warming and and just to show you what's going on in, in a uh, an easy way. This is something that I got from the BBC, one of their reports, um, looking at the the difference um, comparing the years 2010 to 2019 with the years uh, 1980 to 2009. And what you see here is that there are areas that have gotten, uh, of the world, that have gotten hotter by more than two degrees, particularly up uh, in the northern uh, hemisphere, uh, further north, of the hotter it seemed to have gotten. Down in the southern hemisphere, there are still some parts that are actually got a little cooler over those time periods, but not much. And, and there are some hot spots down there as well. So we clearly have something going on here. And this has been summarized in the what is now called the IPCC report that came out this last summer, uh, which was characterized by uh, them as a, a code red for humanity. Now, the IPCC is, stands, stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is a uh, UN-sponsored body that uh, has a large number of climate scientists that are looking at uh, the problem of climate change and trying to figure out, well, what's going on? What can we do about it? That type of thing. Um, so their conclusions are, are first, you know, the obvious ones, I think, that we're probably all already familiar with, that human activity is changing the climate in some unprecedented ways. And sometimes those are irreversible, but we may not be able to get back from even where we are now. Um, there's increasing number of heat waves and droughts and flooding um, and, and key temperature limits are being broken so that, that we're seeing places that are now much hotter than they used to be. Uh, they, this, they say, can be avoided if we act fast. Uh, the question is, can we act fast? And so what we're going to have to do is to cut emissions of greenhouse gases. That could help stabilize the the temperature. But I think the, the UN Secretary General summed it up pretty well when he said, if we combine forces now, we can avert climate catastrophe. But as this today's report makes clear, there's no time for delay and there's no room for excuses. So if we don't do it, we're going to be in big trouble. But from my perspective, it's my kids and even more so my grandkids that are really going to suffer. Uh, due to this. So the world now sees twice as many days as it used to, say 20 years ago uh, or, or 40 years ago, um, of days over 50 degrees C. Now, I just wanted to point out, because you're probably not all used to saying things in, in Celsius, 50 degrees C is 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, you can't really survive at 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, that, that's not a, a situation that, that, that is really compatible with, with life, uh, human life. Um, so we're seeing that 
number of days when we have places that hit 50 degrees Celsius double since the 1980s. Um, and, and this is happening in more areas as well. It's not just happening um, in one area, although the most of them are, are they're, they're tend to be concentrated in the Middle East. Um, total number of days increased each decade. So it just, it just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, and um, in, the, in the time between 1980 and, and 2009, we had about 14 days a year when, when somebody was over 50 degrees C. Um, in the period between 2010 and 2019, that was up to 26 days. It keeps going up like that. We're going to have uh, many more days that, that, that could be problematic for us. Um, so this is becoming more likely, and it's obviously affecting us. It's deadly to us. It's deadly to uh, animals and plants in nature. Um, it's really going to cause problems for any living system. But it's also a real problem for buildings and roads and power systems and things like that. Um, at 122, an asphalt road becomes very, very sticky. I mean, it's, it's, it starts to melt the asphalt. And you, you have a real problem. Uh, as I mentioned, these, these incidences are mainly in the Middle East uh, and the Gulf regions in that area. But not universally. Uh, this last summer, uh, there was a, a temperature in, in southern Italy that hit 48.8. Uh, and in Canada, very surprisingly to me, Monty, you may want to worry about this since you're going to Canada, 49.6. Um, that's a real surprise yeah. uh, for that far north. Um, so, we're going to have more of these unless we count fossil fuel emissions. And the question becomes political will to do that, I think, which we'll probably discuss in further talks later in the semester. Uh, so we're seeing twice as many days over 50 degrees C. Um, that obviously creates great health risks. We're going to have by 2100, this continues to go the way it's been going in terms of global warming. We're going to have about 1.2 billion people around the world face heat stress conditions. Uh, that's going to mean a lot of deaths, to be blunt. So this is going to be, I hate to put the comparison, but worse than the pandemic. Uh, in terms of that, if we don't do something. But we, we luckily have the chance to actually try to, to um, negate some of this. Uh, but we're going to face some real tough choices in terms of um, the drought and the wildfires that are more likely. Uh, the drought, particularly if, for example, if you're a farmer uh, and all of a sudden you don't have water, you're not going to be able to grow crops. Uh, and that's happening in a lot of places. Uh, the Wall Street Journal just yesterday uh, had an article on um, the Colorado River, uh, which of course has uh, been drying up. Uh, and um, it, the article uh, said that the, uh, the Walton Foundation, the, the folks from Walmart, um, have just given uh, $200 million uh, to various organizations to try to figure out how to combat that and how to, to uh, manage to get water uh, to approximately 40 million people in the uh, Southwest that depend on the Colorado uh, for their water. So if we don't do something about that, we're gonna see uh, increases in deserts uh, here and, and increase in the desert land uh, of, of the United States. So this gives you the map of um, the United States with the, just the western part 
uh, on the left, those are all of wildfires that were occurring uh, late this summer. And on the east, you have uh, the drought conditions. And, and what you can see is there's obviously a, a big correlation. You have a lot of drought, you don't get much rain, you're gonna have more wildfires. That, that's fairly obvious. Um, on the other hand, this is the 2021 spring flood outlook uh, for the United States. And you can see it's the exact opposite end. It's, it's mainly on the East Coast and here in the Midwest or going up the Mississippi, um, up and down the Mississippi and some of the tributaries to it that, that are the flood areas. Uh, and and um, this is a, a real um, dichotomy then. We have an area that's, that's drier, getting much drier, getting more wildfires and that type of thing. We have another area that is, is suffering from having too much water. And of course, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, hurricanes and, and additional uh, water coming into this, particularly into this eastern region of the US due to, um, again, strengthening due to, to and becoming more um, due to global warming. But uh, this just gives you the, the overall for the last uh, 30 years, the, the change in the average precipitation uh, the annual precipitation. And you can see that the western half of you is basically divide at the Mississippi River and, and, and pretty much everything west of that uh, is, is becoming more desert-like, it's becoming drier. Uh, and pretty much everything east of it, except for a little bit down in the southeast, uh, is, is becoming wetter. And, and this is just the way uh, things are changing at the moment. It's not just a U.S. problem. And so we can see here um, on the left hand of uh, the fire weather index ranking for the world. And, and you can, if you look at the U.S., you can see that it, it roughly follows what, where the wildfires were. Um, and the same thing as you can see up in, in Western Canada. But you look at the other areas, and there's some huge areas of fire here. The Amazon basin, a large chunk of Brazil, is, is having problems. Uh, Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, uh, particularly right there in the middle of Africa, uh, very high um, fire there. Uh, some of Eastern Europe stretching very strongly into Russia. Again, very high at fire, some down in, in Australia and in Eastern uh, China. Now, if you flip over to the, to the one on the right, which is the floods from 1985 to 2010, you can see that it almost is every place where the fires weren't. So that the local weather and the local conditions do not always mirror the overall warming of the earth, but you have differences here. Uh, and, and the local conditions might be quite different, might be more extreme than the overall warming of the earth. You might, you know, what you might think would happen for the overall warming. So basically then climate change is increasing the intensity of the weather, if you will. The dry places are getting drier. The wet places are getting wetter. Uh, we're seeing um, traditional weather patterns being accentuated. The storms are becoming more powerful. We've seen a number of much stronger hurricanes uh, and, and to some degree tornadoes and things like that as well. The drought areas are becoming drier, more brush, brush and, and forest fires and the number of hot days is increasing, uh, leading to more local heat emergencies. We, you hear a lot about, well, we need to stop at 1.5 degrees. And then other people are saying, well, 
we're not going to be able to stop at 1.5. We should shoot for two, you know, that type of thing. Well, what's the difference between 1.5 degree increase in the overall average temperature of the Earth versus a two degree change? And this is this is the sort of uh, thing you see with climate models. Here, the left-hand column of these are uh, the things happening if we get 1.5 degrees uh, of warming compared to 1950. Over here on the right-hand side, we have what happens if we get two degrees. And it doesn't sound like very much, half a degree Celsius. Gee, that shouldn't have be that bad. But you look at this and you can see the number of hot days increases significantly, particularly around the equator and in the northern hemispheres. Down here, the temperature of the hottest days also increases. There's a lot of area up here, particularly again, in, you know, from South America up, really, Africa up, Australia up to the northern area, increases significantly. And here, I think this is maybe one of the more interesting ones in this panel, change in temperature of the coldest nights. So the coldest night that you, you get in a variety of areas becomes hotter. <laughs> it isn't as cold as it used to be. And uh, again, you see this up in the north. You also see this in the southern hemisphere down by Antarctica. So, um some really different changes and, and two degrees celsius raise is significantly worse than 1.5 degrees celsius and so the earlier we can get going on trying to really back off the temperature change the better off we're going to be the other thing that you need to know is that all of these things are working together um that is to say that if you have a wildfire, it's not just affecting the area that gets burnt. Uh, it creates a huge amount of, of smoke. Um, Donna mentioned the other day how nice some of the, um, how pretty some of the, the uh, uh, sunsets have been lately here in Chicago. Uh, why is that? Well, it's due to the fact that we're getting smoke particles from those fires out on the West Coast. And since North America goes west to east in terms of, of uh, uh, wind patterns and things, um, we're seeing more of those particles and that gives you that brilliant sunsets. This picture shows you how some of the uh, fires last uh, year in, in Australia uh, had these huge plumes of smoke uh, and, and CO2 and CO uh, and other gas that, it, that went out into the ocean. And so what happens when all of this hits, hits the ocean? Well, it does a number of things. It, it certainly um, you know, does things like changing the acidity of the ocean. It makes the ocean uh, more acidic. If you think about when you drink a, um, uh, a bottle of Coca-Cola, now, it has that sharp uh, taste, of, that is to say, you know, that we like, uh, but that's due to the fact that we have carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. That's, that's what you're finding, and that gives you a little more acidic. So Coca-Cola is significantly more acidic than regular water. If you look at this then, and you look at how that's going to affect the sea life. And this is a, um, this is a shore crab. Uh, and um, it being more acidic, it changes the way this uh, crab, for example, and this is only an example uh, the, uh, organism, it changes the way it, it perceives the world and does things. And what they're finding in studying these is that, that at the more acidic uh, ocean, uh, these animals no longer um, sort of take care of their, their, uh, the areas where they, they lay eggs. 
And consequently, the number of uh, crabs is going down. Now, maybe you don't care about the number of crabs, uh, but you know, it's just problematic as to what we're seeing worldwide as we get more climate change, we're altering not only sea chemistry, but life for all sorts of organisms. And that's going to create situations where we're going to start losing our biodiversity, that we're gonna start losing more and more uh, the number of species here on Earth. So what is climate change? What are some of the basics? And uh, why is it happening? And, and so let's take a, a quick look at that. Uh, and there's a couple of questions I'd really like to answer. Uh, what is the difference between a greenhouse effect, climate change, and global warming? Are they the same thing? Well, they're all related, but they're not exactly the same thing. And what proof do we have that climate change is happening? Uh, you have a, a lot of climate deniers who are saying, oh, well, you know, but there is real evidence that this is happening. And finally, why is it happening? So the greenhouse effect, which you've probably heard of, is simply this. We have sunlight, okay? and that light is energy. I mean, you go out on a sunny day, you feel the sun hitting your face, it's warmer. So that sunlight hits the earth, and most of it is reflected. So if you're standing on the moon, you can see the earth. And why can you see the earth? It's because the sunlight that hit the earth got reflected and you could, you could see it up on the moon, okay? But CO2 and other gases uh, in the atmosphere will absorb that light. And what happens when they absorb it is that the molecules of CO2 just simply start moving faster. What does that really mean? temperature is just a reflection of how fast the molecules are moving. The faster they move, the higher the temperature. There's a direct relationship between how fast molecules move and, and what the temperature is. So as we absorb more of that light, as we increase the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, things like methane, for example, in the atmosphere, then we trap more heat because there's more molecules of these uh, absorbing, light absorbing molecules out there. And we trap more heat, we heat up the atmosphere and that heats up, of course, the oceans and the land. Now, just to give you some idea of the effect of atmosphere, here's a comparison between Mars, Earth and Venus. Okay? In Mars, almost all the CO2 is solid CO2. It's down, it's cold enough that it's, it's come out of the atmosphere and it's sort of a CO2 ice, if you will, on the, um, on the planet's surface. So there isn't any CO2 to absorb light there in the, in the atmosphere. And the temperature is about minus 50 Celsius. If you look at, at the Earth, about three hundredths of 1% of our atmosphere is CO2. And we have an average temperature of about plus 15 degrees Celsius. If you look at Venus, 96% of the atmosphere is CO2. And the temperature is 420 Celsius. So you can see that as we compare the three planets here, these three planets, the more CO2 you have, the higher the average temperature, the less, the lower. And, and it's, there's a, a real correlation and shows you how the gases in the atmosphere influence then the temperature of uh, the planet, of the, the surface. So what's the difference here? Global warming is the increase of the Earth's average surface temperature due to a buildup of greenhouse gases that are absorbing light in the atmosphere and okay? absorbing energy from the sun. So that's, that's one thing, but climate change is slightly different. It's the long-term changes in the climate, including average temperature and per 
precipitation. So this recognizes that although the average surface temperature may increase at regional or local levels, we can have temperatures that decrease or remain constant or go up very, very high. Um, so you get all of those possibilities and that's due to the fact that you're looking at weather rather than climate. So we have to remind ourselves that what does average mean? You know, so you take a, you know, if you want to average a whole bunch of numbers, you sum them up and you divide by the number of numbers you, you had in there. So climate is an average of weather conditions all over, over time. But global warming really only refers to the increase in the Earth's average temperature. So again, this just shows the five-year average variation of global surface temperatures from 1884 to, in this case, 2012. Uh, and as you can see, over that period of time, there was a significant between one and two degree um, change in the temperature. Uh, particularly, of course, in the higher latitudes here, further north you go, um, due to the change in the, in the climate. So how does global warming work? Well, as I mentioned before, as the light shines on the Earth, some of this gets absorbed, some of it gets reflected. And we have a balance between how much gets absorbed and how much gets reflected. So carbon dioxide is the main culprit in terms of what gets absorbed. It's not the worst in, in the sense of each individual molecule. Methane actually absorbs more um, energy from the sun than, than carbon dioxide does per molecule. But there's much more carbon dioxide out there. And, and so that's a major uh, problem for us. Where does the carbon dioxide come from? Well, it comes from fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, if you burn those. And, and that's what we've been doing for a long time. And, I, and as a chemist, I, I always get a little perturbed <laughs> burning this because there's so many nice, useful things you can make with these things. <laughs> rather than just burning them up, in which case you destroy them. So as we increase this, then we're gonna increase the amount of, of light absorbed by CO2 and therefore increase the temperature. Uh, and we can see that sort of thing. And so the temperature is gonna to continue to go up. So what proof do we have that this is actually going on? And, and here is just temperature and CO2 data. The temperature data is from about 1880, which is really where we started taking temperatures. And you can see it's gradually increasing. And this is due to the, the um, uh, industrial revolution and everything. But it, it's fairly slow increase until about 1965, 70, somewhere around there. And then it starts taking off more. It, it starts going up. And so, we can see slow start here and then much more rapid over here in the more recent times. Over here, we have a very interesting diagram. Um, this, is, this is the amount of CO2. And this starts not in 1880, but 400,000 years ago. So that's been around for a long time. Now, how are you getting this data? You're, you're, they're doing um, what are called ice cores, and they can, uh, the depth of the ice cores, the first, further down you go into it, uh, the older that is, and you can get ice cores that were laid down 400,000 years ago. And what you can see, and, and then you can analyze the, the amount of CO2 in the ice. Uh, and what you can see is that that goes up and down with a, naturally, between about 180 parts per million to 300 parts per million. 
And the time over which that occurs is about 100,000 years. So there's this long natural uh, change in the CO2 level. And some people say, oh, well, this explains climate change. Well, there's a problem with this explaining climate change. Uh, in the last 20,000 years or so, it was going up. So, so we're getting up to, to this, to, to the normal sort of uh, high point on this range of all this data going back 400,000 years. But then all of a sudden in 1950, if we plot from then, look at this, it just takes off like a rocket ship. And all of a sudden, instead of having a highest of about 300 parts per million, we're well over 380 parts per million and going up rapidly. And so the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing dramatically in recent years. And we see this other ways too. We see this, for example, in glaciers melting. And this is a picture of the Portage Glacier up in Alaska, uh, taken in 1914. And you can see that the glacier extends, it comes from up here and up here and comes down and extends to right over here. Okay? And very nice glacier. Okay. Now, this is the same sort of diagram taken in 2004. And what do you see? Well, here's the glacier back here. This is a lake. It's all melted. So eventually, as that glacier melts, this is all going to eventually run down into the sea. What does that give you? Well, it gives you an increase in sea level. It also means that if you were dependent on this glacier to provide you with drinking water, you'd be in trouble. Because eventually, literally, this is in hundreds of years, but still eventually this disappears. Now, thinking long term here, that's a problem. Because if you think about China and India, for example, the two most populous countries in, in the world, they depend almost entirely in glacial runoff for their water supply, for the drinking water. The rivers that, that, that feed those two countries are, are glacial. Real problems that, that eventually humanity will face if it doesn't do anything here. Here we have two sets of, of data. Uh, the set to the left is uh, satellite data. The set to the right is ground data. The ground data here goes from 1870 to about 19, or well, about 2000. And what you can see is there's a fairly continuous rate in global sea level rise of about 1.7 millimeters per year. That's not a lot, is it? 1.7 millimeters, that's, that's a very small fraction of an inch. But that's still a, a problem over, over this sort of period of time. Um, what's more concerning is that when we look at the later data from 1993 to 2013 or 14, here is when this data, this chart came from, you can see that rates increased. So things are, are happening faster. And this is, as I say, sea level rise. That's leading to a number of um, you know, worrisome situations. There are countries, island countries, that are worried about whether or not they will still exist. If sea level keeps going up, they're, they're losing ground, so to speak. Uh, we're losing places or having to, to do tremendous engineering to save places like Venice, Italy, or London, or of course the, the Dutch have been doing this for years and they they really know how to do this to, to, to protect things by putting in dikes. This last summer, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, suggested that it would be a good idea to put a 20-foot dike 
in front of or surrounding the seaside um, direction from Miami, uh, from the city of Miami. You can, you can imagine how the people in Miami feel about that if you're saying, well, we're going to cut you off from the ocean by it with a 20 foot wall. Um, that, that's, you know, but that's the sort of thing that people are starting to worry about that we're going to have to do to save our ocean based cities. So what sort of climate change do we have in the US? We've got temperatures rising, especially in winter. We've got rainfall and flooding events being more frequently, particularly in the Eastern United States. We have extreme drought and massive world wildfires being more common, particularly in the Western United States. And we have rural communities, farmlands particularly that are being in, impacted, crops and food becoming more scarce uh, and more expensive. And, and all of those have direct impacts on all of us uh, as humans. But it's not only humans. We're losing other species. We're starting to have extinctions of animals that we're living in particular niches uh, in, in uh, our environment. And as those environments heat up slightly uh, or get wetter or burn, um, these species are, are being, uh, being made uh, extinct. And, and that's a problem for us. We're losing that biodiversity. So why is this happening? And it really is directly connected to the CO2 uh, concentration. This is a plot of the atmospheric CO2 concentration uh, measured either early on, um, before we had direct measurements of, of atmospheric CO2 uh, by, uh, again, ice cores. Uh, and then since uh, the 1950s, uh, measured directly um, The National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Agency has measured these things directly for since about the 1950s. And you can see this, this has gone up tremendously uh, in, in parts per million. Um, you know, how, how much CO2 do we have there? So it's pollution from coal, natural gas, and oil primarily. And these are how we're generating our electricity and how we're running our cars um, are, are the are two very major things. They're not the only ones, and there's a lot of other, other things, but these are, these are major things. Uh, and so uh, we have warming uh, of uh, climates. Well, the climate system seems to be unequivocal, and the human influence on that has been clear. And this, this is from that same committee report, but from their 2014 version. And the real problem here is we didn't do much. Now, there's going to be a big climate conference next month, or actually, I guess this month, um, up in Glasgow. And hopefully, people will make some more commitments to doing things. But the real problem is going to be how do we get people to follow through on their commitments? And Pastor Monty and I are going to be giving, I think, a total of three more presentations. They're going to talk a little bit about that type of problem. Um, you know, how do we, we motivate folks to be, be serious about this? Uh, okay, so that, I believe, yeah, no, I got a summary here. Okay, so, so in, in summary then, from the climate change, it's it's obviously affecting people, it's affecting our ecosystems, it's affecting life, livelihood all the way around the world. We're really gonna have uh, big changes in the way life happens if, if we don't do something. If we can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, which is about half a degree hot more than, than what we have right now, uh, that would really cut down the worst of these consequences. It won't make it won't be that there aren't any consequences. There are going to be consequences, but 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 it would cut down the worst ones. 
Um, it, and, and so there's clear benefits to having it, the temperature raise only be 1.5 degrees rather than two. Um, and this change in 1.5 degrees, you know, the types of things we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to develop new technologies. We're gonna have to uh, change where we get our source of energy and going more to solar and wind and that type of thing. Uh, that's going to actually create a lot of jobs. Uh, and, and there are already more people employed in the United States in the solar industry than there are in the coal industry. And uh, we need to, to really um, go in that direction. And so we're, as I say, we're going to have three more uh, talks later on um, how you, you go about doing some of this. Okay, I think that's sort of, nope, I still got more. Forgot how many slides I had, folks, sorry. So um, we've already changed compared to pre-industrial times by about one degree in terms of global warming. And we're seeing consequences already in terms of the wildfires, et cetera. We'll hit the 1.5 somewhere between 2030 and 2052. And, but these past emissions that we've had and everything, they don't make this rise in temperature. I mean, we're, we can prevent a lot of it, not all of it perhaps, but a lot of it. It comes down to societal and political will to do it. That I do believe is the last time. So I just wanted to point out, um, Next week, we have the Congregational Budget Hearing, so we're not going to have a meeting. Um, the week after, Pastor Monty is going to talk about our response to the climate change. Uh, then the week after that, I'll be back to talk about sort of some of the same things, but how can we put out the fire, so to speak. Uh, after that, we have, uh, Marsha Smith has organized a blood drive, so That'll be that weekend. And then Pastor Monty will get the last word on the climate change. Uh, we have a number of other programs scheduled. Uh, fall congregational meeting, of course. The uh, ECRA Thanksgiving. Uh, so we won't have one that. We decided not to have a program on the Thanksgiving weekend because we think most of you are going to be with families. Hopefully you will. And uh, then Richard Anderson is going to present two, I, I think, what will be very interesting talks on what he has titled Sacred Trash. Uh, so I'll let him explain that at some point in time. So uh, let me end show. Okay. Uh, questions, folks? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Or Gloria, you can send a, a chat message. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Ken, for putting the presentation together. It was very interesting. I do a lot of reading and stuff, so this is of interest for me. And going back, I mean, I'm old, but not that old. But I can still, I can say that looking at weather patterns from the time of being a child to now, you, you cannot, well, I'm, I'm sure you can turn away from it. But if you're aware in any degree, weather patterns have certainly changed. And having grown up on a farm, I can only just imagine what farmers go through with the different temperature changes, how that affects crops, uh, dealing even with bugs and rodents and other things that come into the fields. All of these things are grossly affected by this. And I can go from childhood to now and I can see where these things are happening. And I know that there's so much that's attractive to people in terms of an industry because people want to make money, but there's got to be a view to this, I think, looking at this in a way of how can we maintain a certain level of living and, and dealing with things, but not being so abusive to our world. Yeah, obviously we're going to have to have some real changes in the way we do things to try to mitigate the amount of destruction we're doing uh, 
in, in terms of these climate changes. Uh, the farmers are hitting it first, obviously. Um, I mean, their, their situation, um, as areas become more desert-like in the West, there's a lot of folks who are, are going to have real problems. Um, people who depend, obviously, on the Colorado River for water, which a lot of the West, Southwest does. Um, that's, I mean, that's the first time that, that that river has, has been in trouble in, in ever is this year. Um, and people are reporting that, and I've seen several reports on, on the PBS NewsHour where um, they've interviewed farmers that, that have wells that are going dry and, and so they can't water their crops. And we may have to change some types of, of things that we do. Uh, for example, I, I saw one report where if you compare what different crops need in terms of water, uh, some crops need a lot more water than others, depend, you know, compared to the nutritional value that they get. And um, so almonds, for example, which are a very big crop in California, take huge amounts of water to grow. Uh, and so maybe we gotta do something about how many almonds we eat. I, you know, I love almonds, yeah. so I am not happy about that at all. Well, but, but growing yeah. alfalfa in Arizona, it's a very water intensive crop. Yeah. And maybe we don't need to grow it in Arizona. That's true. Um, Gloria writes in the chat, thank you, Ken. This is all disturbing. I hope we can do something about it. Yeah, I hope so too. I think we need to watch this climate conference that's coming up in, in Glasgow. But, you know, we have a history of having these conferences and everybody saying, you know, we had the Paris Accords a few years back and everybody's saying, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then some people do about half of it and other people do nothing. Uh, and <laughs> it, 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 you know. Well, or this budget reconciliation process that, uh, yep. Yeah, the climate part is all in the, um, well, primarily in the second bill there, which is the one that's running in the most trouble. I think the yeah. first bill has enough bipartisan support that it's going to come through, but the second bill, which has the climate change part into it primarily, uh, I mean, it has a lot of stuff into it, but um, that, yeah. that may be more of a problematic. And, you know, I wouldn't be too surprised to watch politicians specifically clear, kill the climate part. So, yeah, I mean, I hope part, I'm wrong, but I, I've heard that part is maybe part of what they're they're cutting out. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always a, a, a personal a sense of personal response and what can we do and that. But then there's also a public policy response and it seems probably that public policy response is what's most needed to, to move us. The state of Illinois uh, just enacted new legislation again that um, will make Illinois a leader in um, moving from dirty fuels to cleaner fuels. That does include also um, nuclear, uh, nuclear power plants. Yeah. Um, which have their own problems. Yeah. Um, there again, that's a um, push the problem down the road philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, you can you can bury the nuclear waste. waste. We have ways of, of capturing it in glass mm. uh, and then burying the glass now, um, mm. which keeps it from leaking out for, you know, 50, 60,000 years, which is pushing it way down the road, but it's not eliminating it. And eventually that's gonna come back to bite humanity, not obviously in any of our lifetimes. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for all your preparation and uh, putting Thank this you. together. Thank you all hey, for yeah. coming. Yeah.
Okay. All right. See you in a couple of weeks, I guess. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.